Hello, and welcome to my weekly podcast, which I call Through the Bible in 10 Years. Now, what we've done for the last two weeks is we took a slight diversion into Galatians 1 and Galatians 2. So we did Acts 15, and then we did Galatians 1 and Galatians 2. And now I want to return to where we left off in Acts 15 and extend into Acts 16. So as we finish the book of Acts over the next um, uh, few months, um, I want to take some diversions into Paul's letter, inserting a look at Paul's letters at the place where they would fit into the narrative of Acts. So today we begin where we left off um, three weeks ago uh, at Acts 15, verse 36. So we only did up to verse 35 when we did Acts 15 because we were looking at the Jerusalem Council. Here's somewhere where if I were uh, in the Middle Ages, the 1200s, uh, putting the chapter divisions in, I would have started the new chapter here uh, with verse 36. Uh, because remember, the chapter divisions are not part of the original text of the Bible. We, as educated exegetes, are allowed to tamper with the uh, divisions and the versifications as we um, inductively see fit. So let's go ahead and begin. We've had the end of the Jerusalem Council, and uh, Acts 15.35 ends with Paul and Barnabas back in Antioch, and there's much rejoicing. Yay! Everyth everything's good. Um, or is it? Um, you might have picked up, if you followed me these last two weeks in Galatians 1 and Galatians 2, that I think even after the initial, following the kind of the story of, of Galatians 2, even after Paul had secured the sense that, yes, Gentiles can be Christians without being um, circumcised, that there was still a sense that the Gentiles weren't quite, not, not on Paul's part, not on Barnabas's part, but headquarters seemed to think that Gentile Christians were still second-rate Christians. That is, they weren't, they weren't fully, uh, they weren't quite as in as the Jewish Christians were. If they, and you could hear this, if they were really serious about their faith, they'd be willing to get circumcised and fully convert to Judaism. I'm, I'm echoing things I, I think I probably heard growing up in a holiness context. Well, if you really were sold out to God, you'd be willing to give up uh, X, whatever X might be. And so I'm not sure that um, Acts 15.35 really ends uh, with everything as hunky-dory as we might think. I have a hunch that Paul spent the bulk of his um, second and third missionary journey somewhat in tension um, with headquarters, that he wasn't quite the, he wasn't on any poster at headquarters. He wasn't being appearing in any videos uh, that headquarters was sending out. We'll put it, we'll put it that way. And I don't want to glorify um, a certain kind of innovator, but I know that there have been, um, especially church planters and um, kind of pastors who, who really seem to impact their environment more heavily, a lot of times that type of person isn't on headquarters uh, favorite list. Now, that's not true right now. For those of you who might be Wesleyans watching this, um, headquarters right now is very much in favor of church planters, very much in favor of innovators. So I, I want to be clear, I'm not talking about uh, the Wesleyan church today, but I know um, I've heard stories from uh, people like Kevin Meyer at, uh, at 12 Stone. I know um, uh, even our beloved uh, General Superintendent Wayne Schmidt um, had some tensions with headquarters at, at various points uh, long ago in a faraway place. Um, innovators sometimes, now I'm not, again, I'm not glorifying innovators as if, as if the entrepreneurs, the, what we might call the apostolic amongst, amongst us, that they're not always right on everything. I'm not wanting to say that. I, but I do want to say that there does tend to be a tension within the church between the kind of institutional church and the, what we might call, uh, I would, see, I would, I would use different words than are, are popular right now. I would call the institutional church more um, the apostolic church, like Peter and John, and I would call the innovative church the prophetic, uh, the prophetic church. Uh, that the charismatic prophetic uh, among us tend to stretch things, whereas the apostolic, which represents the, the kind of tradition and the history 
Um, uh, now, again, it, 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 it kind of gets messy because Paul's an apostle. Um, um, and so basically, let's take those titles out and say that there is an often, often a tension between those who, through whom the Holy Spirit is stretching things and those who represent tradition and, and, and the kind of stability of the past. And these two tend to be in tension, the, the, the kind of prophetic, charismatic, stretching the bounds and the, the institution. And there's a tendency for entrepreneurs, um, and I, I consider myself to be a little bit more on the entrepreneurial uh, innovative side, um, although I play nice, I think. Uh, there, there's a tendency for that, that group to very much annoy the people who like the stability, the structure, the, 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 this is the way we've always done it, you know, kind of the, and of course, what are the kind of institutional things, the creeds, the orthodoxy, the, the orthopraxy of the, of the, of the past um, versus the attempt to, to be um, relevant and con contemporary and uh, contextualized in the present. And these two tend to, these tend to be at odds with each other. And I think we, not that they don't, they don't have to be, but I mean, there's always a tension between uh, the past and the future in, in this kind of a space. And we see this, I think, with Paul in the Jerusalem church. Paul is making people uncomfortable uh, and making some people angry. And of course, they make Paul angry too. <laughs> um, okay, well, is that, how's that for a preface? Let's go ahead and dive in with verse 36. And after certain days, uh, Paul spoke to Barnabas, uh, having returned, uh, indeed, he's, this is Paul talking now, let us look after the brothers, let us episcopeo, let us uh, oversee, this is the word that is related to the word bishop, let us oversee the brothers. Let's go back. Um, remember, they'd gone on their first missionary journey to Cyprus, uh, and then to the middle of Turkey, places like Antioch of Pisidia, Lystra, Derby, Iconium, those places. Let us go back and oversee the brothers in every city in which we announced um, the word of the Lord. Uh, see how, they, how they're doing. Um, so Paul wants to go back. And this is good, of course, because um, those who only make a first pass um, and don't, so those who just evangelize and, and who don't go back and disciple. Um, this is, of course, one of the things that Billy Graham uh, expressed regret about uh, at one point of his ministry, that he had, he had done some great things with the crusades and with getting people saved, so to speak, but uh, he had not, at least in his early years, done as good a job at setting up a discipleship system. And of course, let's remember that when the Great Commission says, go and make disciples, it's not primarily even talking about the entryway uh, because it involves baptizing them, not only baptizing them, but teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded, which is not done on a weekend. Uh, and so the discipleship takes longer than just praying something on the back of a card. It takes a long time. And so we can, we can completely agree with Paul in wanting to go back uh, to the churches that they had founded on their first missionary journey. Good for you, Paul. Verse 37, now Barnabas said, sounds good, Paul, and he purposed to take along also John, the one being called Mark. Uh, uh, okay, well, here's the thing. Remember, Mark left them. Um, let's read verse 38. But Paul was not, uh, uh, Paul was, um, was thinking that this is the one who had gone away from them, from Pamphylia, and had not gone with them. Uh, into the work. Um, he didn't want to take this guy along. Um, and now we don't know 100% why Mark didn't continue on, you know, into the, the, the middle of Turkey. Um, at the very least, he looks like a quitter. Um, and of course, Paul wants to have, you know, somebody who he can count on. I don't want to have to carry all the luggage. Um, and so he wants somebody who's going to have stick to itiveness, somebody who's going to keep going. I understand Paul's hesitance. By the way, Paul commends Mark at the end of Colossians, Colossians 4. So uh, I think it's, it's important to realize that even though Paul doesn't think that Mark is the right person today, he eventually commends him. Uh, Mark somehow, we don't know how, wins Paul over by the time it's all done. Um, and so, uh, you know, Paul 
you, you don't have to, being a leader doesn't, um, you can't always be nice as a, as a leader. And I'm, I'm, I hope you understand what I'm, what I'm about to get at here, that leaders have to make hard decisions. And um, even, though, even though God judges us according to our heart, I, I completely, that's very Wesleyan and I completely, it's very biblical that God looks on the heart. And so in terms of our eternal fate, in terms of how God judges us when we stand before the Lord, God judges us according to our intentions in terms of our individual personality. But leadership isn't about intentions. Leadership is about getting things uh, done in the real world. Where are we going? Leadership implies you're going somewhere. And so if, if, if you are leading and you don't get somewhere, it's hard to say that you are succeeding in your leadership. Now, of course, sometimes leadership is a spiritual leadership and getting somewhere involves, a, you know, the heart. So, okay, fair enough. But, but in terms of an organization or in terms of a mission, such what is Paul's mission here? Paul's mission here is to see the gospel uh, spread to the whole world and, and that there's an outcome involved there, namely reaching the whole world. And so when you're, when you're a leader, um, you, of course, take into account intentions, but outcomes are essential uh, to a leadership of this sort. And so, you know, Mark might have said, you're not being nice. Why aren't you letting me go with you, Paul? But Paul is concerned with accomplishing the mission and having someone on the team that isn't going to uh, effectively get you to the finish line. That's not good leadership. And so um, uh, this is a, something that um, I've, I've heard um, Dr. Mullen say quite a bit um, uh, since I've been here at Houghton, uh, how important it is for us to uh, not just have good intentions, but for us to actually reach our goals. And I completely, I completely agree with that, even though uh, if you know me, you know I'm, I'm very much uh, oriented around the heart when it comes to how God judges us and with regard to, to morality. But leadership is not about um, final judgment. Uh, leadership is about getting things done in this life, in this world now. And so it, there, there is nothing at all wrong uh, with Paul not taking Mark along because uh, Paul didn't think that Mark was going to be effective in the leadership. Of course, uh, if you've uh, heard anything by me or read any of my books, I have two book. I have a book on Acts, I have books on, on Paul, three books on Paul, uh, put out by West, Wesleyan Publishing House. These are the kind of books that you could use in a church Bible study. Um, if, you, if you've followed me at all, uh, you know that I think there's more going on here than Luke is telling us. And that's why we went to Galatians 1 and 2. Because you remember that Paul and Barnabas disagreed about what happened at Antioch. And, and in Galatians 2, I, I don't think I said this last week, but Paul usually tells us when he wins an argument. Remember what he says when they went down to Jerusalem and they acknowledged that I was right and they did not force Titus to be circumcised. Um, and so when Paul wins the argument, he tells us, Paul does not at all say that he won the argument at Antioch. I think he lost it, uh, the lost the argument. And so Barnabas and Paul uh, split on this. Now, I don't think that they disagreed on the substance. I think Paul and Barnabas both agree that Jews and Gentiles should eat together. I think Barnabas was trying to, to keep the peace, and Barnabas was trying to submit to the Jerusalem leadership and basically say, okay, Paul, we'll figure this out. For the moment, let's obey uh, headquarters, let's obey Peter, let's have separate communion, separate Lord love feasts, separate Lord's suppers, we'll eat separately for a little while, and we'll figure this out. Paul didn't agree. And of course, Paul is the one who ends up in scripture, right? We have 13 letters from Paul. We have no letter from Peter on this subject. We have no letter from Barnabas at all, as far as we know. And so Paul tells us, I think, what God thinks. Namely, God thinks they should have eaten together. Paul, God agrees with Paul and not with Barnabas on this. Now, you can, we, can, we can debate that if you want to, because we could say that Paul wasn't very tactful and that Paul, maybe Paul shouldn't have shouldn't have uh, uh, called Peter hypocrite in front of the whole church. Okay, maybe, maybe that we could argue that. But Paul and Barnabas had a, had a disagreement here. And so I think, you know, Luke, Luke one of Luke's uh, objectives, I think, is to show that the early church was harmonious and peaceful and, and that they did everything decently and in order. And, and it's, not, 
it's not lying for him not to tell about all of the warts of the early church. So he doesn't tell about the blow up at Antioch. That's okay. He's not lying. I mean, if I go for a job interview and everything goes great and we get to the end of it and they haven't asked me a crucial question that is embarrassing to me, probably it's not, it's not unchristian to, to, to just keep quiet. I mean, I don't think the Lord would say, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. There are all kinds of bad things about me. You didn't ask me that I want to volunteer. I don't think, as my mother used to tell me, you don't have to say everything you know. Um, and so I don't think that Luke is, is wrong or bad for not telling about the fact that it was a little messier maybe than he tells uh, Theophilus about here. Um, but uh, there's also the possibility that Mark, Mark wasn't at this point, it's possible Mark wasn't fully on board uh, with the mission to the Gentiles. Maybe, maybe Mark and Barnabas both would have said now, for the time being, Paul, let's have separate love feasts with Gentiles and Jewish Christians in, in Cyprus. I mean, we, we don't know the full extent of the disagreement here. We, we only get a very superficial sense of, of the disagreement. Maybe, remember Mark, I suggested maybe Mark wasn't happy with Paul taking charge. Uh, again, these are just guesses. Uh, but there's a, a more going on below the surface of this iceberg, I think, than Luke tells us about. And so there's a sharp disagreement, verse 39. And there came a sharp disagreement so that they separated from one another. Barnabas, taking Mark, sailed to Cyprus. Now, I don't really like conflict. I don't. I don't like conflict at all. Um, I've had people say, oh, you like conflict. Look at your Facebook post, Ken. But that's not actually true. Uh, I'm a transmitter. I like to talk. I like to tell things. I like to teach. And um, sometimes um, I, I actually uh, take down Facebook posts when uh, these days when they get out of hand. And even when, even after a few hours, I, I uh, may take down a post that, that is a little bit um, pushing the, the envelope with a particular uh, audience or a particular uh, group. I don't like conflict. Probably for most of my life, I, I would have thought that the goal is conflict resolution. That is that in the church, um, we should try to resolve conflict. When I was the Dean of the School of Theology and Ministry, uh, well, actually before I was the Dean of the School of Theology and Ministry, um, we used to pride ourselves in the fact that we didn't have a lot of arguments. Uh, we used to pride ourselves in the fact that most votes were were unanimous, and that if somebody disagreed, they just didn't vote. That was in my early days at um, Indiana Wesleyan. But I've I've come to realize, especially as I've as I've taken leadership roles in these last ten years, um, I've come to realize that that conflict actually uh, is not all bad. Now, if it breaks stuff, that's bad. But the the, the benefit of conflict is. A lot of times, the best option doesn't emerge when everybody keeps quiet if they if they don't agree. That better options emerge when we're in the tension of ideas that disagree with each other. And so, um, uh, and I learned this as we were designing Wesley Seminary's leadership course uh, some ten years ago now, uh, more than ten years ago now. Um, that um, we we should really talk more about conflict management rather than conflict resolution. For one, you simply won't be able to resolve every conflict. But also, good things can come out of conflict. If Christians could, could actually um, learn how to argue with each other better, uh, we might not have as much polarization. I mean, part of, part of the problem of polarization in our current society now is that we don't talk to each other. We just yell at each other. We don't, we don't find the synthesis of the good of both positions uh, because we are too, too busy either in our own echo chamber uh, trashing the other side or it, when we talk to each other, we just yell at each other. When, when we were heading into the 2016 election, there was a lot of tension on Facebook. I'd never seen anything like it. Family members never talked to each other. I, in fact, I don't know where I was. I think it was on, uh, I was reading on Twitter uh, this week uh, last week about a daughter who, who just stopped talking to her mother. Um, that she just says, I'm, I, haven't, I will no longer have anything to do with my mother. A lot of that was happening in the 2015-2016 year uh, um, leading up to the, the election. I mean, it was a bloodbath on social media. And there wasn't a lot of good resolution 
uh, of the tension. A lot of people just retreated into their own corner of the universe and, and they're not even talking to each other um, anymore because everybody has kind of staked their claim in, in what the right uh, positions to have are in this current polarized uh, situation. Well, it's good to have some conflict if we can actually find a way to coexist uh, with, with differences of opinion. Uh, and, and to where that we can actually disagree with each other and still come to the communion table um, and, and drink from the same cup and drink from the, and eat from the same uh, bread. And even though Paul and Barnabas go their separate ways here, really good things come out of this, really good things. If Paul had gone with Barnabas to Cyprus, then he wouldn't have ended up going to Greece, at least not nearly as soon. Um, this conflict launches Paul into Greece. And we never hear, I mean, we, as far as we know, I believe Barnabas probably went on to do great things, but Paul went on to do so much greater things than anything that Barnabas ever did in terms of mission. I mean, I'm sure that Barnabas had a great mission to Cyprus with Mark, but he's not in the New Testament. We don't hear anything about him. I'm, again, I'm sure he did great things and he did great spiritual things. But in terms of preaching the gospel to the whole world, the Gentile world, uh, now God would have used someone else if there hadn't been a Paul, uh, but the Gentile world reached, the good, the good news reached the Gentile world because of Paul. And Paul was unleashed by the separation from Barnabas here. Paul was unleashed to write uh, the, some of the most important books of the New Testament. Paul was unleashed to write and to mission because they went each other's way. Their, their own separate way. And so God can redeem even bad conflict. Now, I don't think this was bad conflict. I think this was probably good conflict. Paul and Barnabas remain friends as far as I know. Paul speaks favorably about Barnabas in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I pick up a positive to, tone about Barnabas in, in 1 Corinthians 9. Um, but here's an ex example of a situation where God uses conflict to do great things. When I was in Germany um, in uh, 2004 uh, for a sabbatical, uh, we happened to be at a church uh, where, the, this, again, we went to an international church, and the Sunday that we were there, a man who had caused a church split, split came back to talk to the church. So he had been in this fellowship, and he had led, he'd led people away. He'd led, he'd led a split. And so it was a good act of reconciliation for them to let him come and speak, uh, having caused great divi division sometime before, 10 years before. Now, what was interesting, he said, don't argue very long with each other. He said, if you can't reconcile your disagreements, multiply the mission. Instead of, and it, what he, the way I took it was, don't have a church split, have a church multiplication. Instead of arguing with each other and like, oh, you aren't Christians. Well, you aren't Christians. Well, you aren't Christians. Well, you aren't Christians. Why not say, you know what? We're both Christians. We don't agree with each other. Let's go multiply the church. And so not think of it as a split, but think of it as a group going out on cadre um, to plant another church. I, I really like that. Although I, I hope I hope that uh, it doesn't happen that way uh, very often. But um, if it could happen, it could happen by the power of the Holy Spirit. So Barnabas and Mark go back to Cyprus for their little bitty little mission. <laughs> and Paul takes Silas and makes a beeline for Greece. But Paul, having chosen Silas, went out, uh, having been um, handed over to the grace of the Lord by the brothers. So this sounds like, you know, they're not all against Paul. Uh, although, I, again, I think there were some that were against Paul at Antioch. I really do think that. 41, and he was passing through Syria and Cilicia. Um, strengthening the churches. I, I personally wonder, I, I have to think, that in those years between 36 and 44, when Paul was back in Tarsus, I, I've said this, I think he must have been spreading the gospel in the region of Cilicia, and probably even up into Cappadocia. Uh, why doesn't he go back to those places on his missionary journey? I think he's already crossed them off the list. But when he goes back with Silas, he goes back through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening churches that maybe he founded back in the late 30s and, and early 40s um, even. Silas is, of course, somebody who'd been sent from Jerusalem up to, uh, to Antioch as, uh, again, part of the interplay between Antioch and Jerusalem. But Silas apparently is more on Paul's side 
uh, than maybe Barnabas was in some of those conflicts. And so uh, Silas is a, a native um, a Greek speaker. Silas is mentioned in 1 Peter. Uh, 1 Peter says, through Silas at the end. What does that mean? Um, a lot of people like to think that it was that Silas maybe was uh, the person who delivered 1 Peter to all the different churches in, uh, in that region, Cappadocia, Bithynia, Pontus, Asia. Um, I wonder, my, I personally, a lot of people disagree with me. I know Absin Joseph would disagree with this uh, comment I'm about to make, but I, I personally don't see Peter writing 1 Peter without help, without a lot of help. I just don't think that the, the Greek of 1 Peter is likely uh, to have come from Peter's hand without some substantial help. Um, so I, I'm, I'm in the minority opinion, I think, in um, thinking that that through Silas may indicate uh, a little bit of help uh, that uh, Peter had in writing First Peter from Silas. Again, minority opinion, um, uh, but um, uh, I'll leave it at there. So that brings us to Acts chapter 16. So, and uh, they, they uh, met also into Derby and Lystra. So they're, they're they came up a different path. So I'm not sure that I can do this, uh, the, the bat mirror, mirror image, let me try. So uh, before they came up from Cyprus and then did a little bit of a, little bit of a hook um, in the middle of Turkey. Now they're coming in from, from the side, from Antioch through Cilicia to Derby and then to, to Lystra. And so, and behold, a certain follower, a disciple was there by the name of Timothy, young man. So this is the first time we're being introduced to Timothy in Acts. Son of a, a Jewish woman, a, a faithful Jewish woman, believing Jewish woman, but his father was Greek. So he's from a mixed marriage. Uh, the mother is Jewish. The father is not. Uh, the father uh, doesn't say whether the father's a god fear or not. We don't know the backstory here. Um, you know, marriages um, were often a matter of family arrangement. Um, and And so... Uh, we don't know exactly how this came to be, but life is messy. A and so now, of course, Jewish lineage in the, in the Mishnah, Jewish lineage is uh, apparently traced through the mother. And so he is considered Jewish, even though his father is Greek. His mother, uh, we know her, her name was Eunice uh, from 2 Timothy, and his grandmother's name was Lois, we know from Timothy. Uh, Timothy, who... Uh, was witnessed by those in Lystra and Iconium, brothers. Verse 3, uh, Paul wanted this one to go out with him because he doesn't have Mark to carry his luggage. He needs someone else. It's time. How about Timothy? Now, Titus is probably with them as well, um, although Titus is not mentioned in Acts for some reason. Very curious. I want to ask Luke about this when we get to the kingdom. So, and having taken him, he circumcised him because of him being uh, them being Jews in the, those parts. Now, uh, again, I think Paul here, again, very strategic, he now has Titus, who's Gentile, who's not circumcised, who he can use as his go-between, his messenger with Gentiles, and he now has Timothy, who's circumcised, who he can use as his go-between with Jews. So this is very strategic. Did Paul think that Timothy need to be circum needed to be circumcised? Um, I'm not sure. I think, I think Paul still would have wanted Jews to be circumcised. He clearly did not believe that Gentiles needed to be circumcised, but I think Paul would have still circumcised his own son if he'd have had one. As far as we know, he didn't. Um, what, some have suggested he might have been married, um, you know, and then his, maybe his wife, who might have been the daughter of a prominent Pharisee, went back home after he became a Christian. That's all speculation novel novel stuff. We have nothing um, uh, that concretely says anything like that. That's a little tangent. Um, but uh, by the way, there's a, there's a comment in, in Galatians that makes it sound like Paul's opponents are saying, well, Paul believes in circumcision. Paul had Timothy circumcised. So you see, even Paul knows that circumcision is the best way to go. Um, and this really ticks Paul off in Galatians. Eventually, we'll get there. Uh, and read that. But I think that probably what that argument is alluding to is the fact that Paul circumcised Timothy. And so they're saying, look, even Paul thinks that you need to be circumcised, which really ticks him off. Okay, 
So he has Timothy circumcised, for they all knew that his father was Greek. Uh, verse 4, then when they were passing through the cities, um, they were handing over to them to keep the dogmas, to keep the decrees uh, that had been decided by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem. Now, um, okay, uh, let's, I don't know, Paul doesn't mention them in 1 Corinthians or, or Romans, um, but Luke is, you know, they were under the submission, they were in submission, uh, they were in submission to the Jerusalem leadership. Verse 5, therefore, all the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they were abounding in their number uh, daily. Okay, verse 6. And then having passed through Phrygia and the Galatian country, so I believe they're tracing their steps back through Iconium and through Antioch of Pisidia. Um, and, and there's actually a Roman road. I, I hope my mirror image is right here. There's a Roman road um, where if you keep going toward the northwest, you come to a cross crossing there. And if you go south, it goes into Asia. And if you go north, it goes into Bithynia. But if you go straight, it goes to Troas. I learned this from um, uh, Robert Mulholland in a course I took at Asbury. He's the one that I first heard say this. Um, and so having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia, so don't go south, uh, verse seven, but uh, having gone into Mysia, uh, they were attempting to go into Bithynia, so that would be this way, um, and they were not permitted by the Spirit of Jesus. The Spirit of Jesus is the Holy Spirit. Uh, they're the same. Uh, verse 8, uh, and uh, having gone into Mysia, they came down into Troas, so they keep going to the coastline. Troas is, of course, uh, near the site of the Trojan War, uh, and so if you go there, you can actually, you can actually touch. I've actually touched foundations of Troy uh, from about 1000 or 1200 BC, the Trojan War. Um, uh, verse 9, and a vision came in the night to Paul, appeared to Paul, a man, certain man of Macedonia uh, was standing and encouraging him and saying, cross over into Macedonia and help us. Come on over. So this is crossing the Bosphorus from Troas to um, uh, what would now be, it's still Turkey, it's Turkey today, and it, it wasn't Europe then. Um, so a lot of times we think, oh, he's going into Europe. It wasn't Europe back then. It was, it was Macedonia, which is north of, of Greece. Um, and so um, it's not, it's, he's not, he's not leaving the Muslim world. I mean, I've, I've heard these sorts of things, and you just think, man, learn your history. Uh, this is not, there's no, it's not the Muslim world going in, Muslim world going into the European world. That's completely wrong. The, the coast of, of Turkey, Ephesus, these are Greek-speaking places. Um, uh, all, of, all of Turkey was Greek-speaking, at least as a second language. It was the business language, the lingua franca of the day. So this isn't the big cultural jump uh, that I've heard people say uh, in the past. Anyway, um, verse uh, 10. And when he saw the vision, immediately, we, we, wow, what do you mean we? Uh, we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Here's the first we, the we passages of Acts. Here's the first one here. And so um, basically, uh, the we here is where the author of Luke Acts joins them. And so uh, let's say it's Luke. Luke apparently was at Troas uh, when Paul first met him. And so the author of Acts now joins this. We join the story in progress at Troas. Um, and uh, Luke is going to go from Troas uh, to Philippi, and then he's going to stay at Philippi uh, for a number of chapters, and then Paul will pick him back up uh, on his way to Jerusalem. Um, so here's the, the first of the we passages of, of Acts. So they come to Philippi. So this is the founding of the church at Philippi. Verse 11, and having sailed from Troas, we made a straight, we made a straight course to Samothrace, uh, and on the following day into Neapolis, which is the port city of Philippi. Verse 12, and from there into Philippi, 
which is the first of the district of Mace first city of the Macedonian district, uh, a colony. So this is a Roman colony. Um, a lot of times Rome after, so it's not good to have a bunch of soldiers uh, and generals hanging around Rome because you can have takeover. Um, Romans, Roman generals were supposed to disband their troops uh, before they crossed the Rubicon. This was Caesar's famous thing. You know, he, he crossed the Rubicon with his soldiers, which he wasn't supposed to do. Um, and so one of the ways to diffuse this potential situation is to give soldiers property uh, somewhere. Uh, Philippi was a founded as a Roman uh, colony. Well, it wasn't founded as a Roman colony, but it, uh, I, I'm trying to remember my, my history exactly. It was a Roman colony. Um, I think it was founded by Philip of Macedon uh, before, uh, who's the father of Aristotle, or not, no, I'm sorry, the follower, follower of Ale Alexander the Great. So that would have predated the Roman uh, possession of this area. Um, it may be that Philippi, I'm trying to remember my, my history, Philippi may have been uh, somewhat trashed. Uh, there was a battle at Philippi with, um, I think, Julius Caesar or, or either that or, or Augustus, one of them, um, in the civil wars um, about a century b before this. In any, in any case, Philippi had become a Roman colony, which means that it was founded by Roman soldiers. Latin was the official uh, language of uh, Philippi, although clearly Paul can write Philippians in Greek and be understood. Uh, and so um, this is a, a Roman colony. If you're a citizen of the city of Philippi, and not everybody in the city was, but if you're a citizen of the F city of Philippi, you are a citizen of Rome. Um, and not everybody was a citizen of Rome, not at all. So they, they come to Philippi. Uh, Paul goes to metropolises. He goes to the big cities. Um, there was a, a Wesleyan uh, program in the 80s called Metro Move. The idea was to model model ourselves after Paul by going to big cities around the world. Anyway, and there were in this city staying, uh, they stayed in the city certain number of days. And uh, on the day of the Sabbath, um, we went outside of the gate um, alongside a river where it, was custom, where it was customary for there to be a place of prayer. And having sat down, we began speaking uh, to the women who had gathered. Now, this is interesting. Um, sometimes people have suggested that there may not have been 10 men for there to be the founding of a synagogue um, in Philippi. Uh, there were women here. You have, uh, According to the Mishnah, you need 10 men to found a syn synagogue. Um, although I personally find it very, very hard to believe uh, that there would not have been 10 Jewish men in the city of Philippi. Some have suggested that perhaps um, Jews were kicked out of the colonies uh, of Rome. Uh, in the year 49, the Emperor Claudius kicked some Jews out of, um, out of the city of Rome uh, because of arguments over Jesus. So in the, just about a year before this event right here, um, I think it was probably Jewish Christians rather than all Jews. It would have been quite staggering for all Jews to have been kicked out of uh, Rome. Uh, but um, I think at least the majority of Jewish Christians probably were kicked out of uh, out of Rome at that time, a year, about a year before this, in the year 49. So we're about the year 50 uh, as we read this, somewhere around there, 40, late 49 or 50. So it, it is curious as to why, and, and not every city had a synagogue building at this point. Synagogue buildings are just now beginning to come into play. Um, and so I, I'm not surprised that there's no synagogue building um, in Philippi, but um, they uh, they knew that there would probably be a gathering, a, and that's what a synagogue is, a gathering, synagogue, a gathering. They knew there would be a gathering of Jews probably along the river. Um, there may have been many, by the way, there may have been many gatherings of Jews in the city of Philippi, uh, but how would you find them? How would you know where they were? Um, I, again, um, I'm just, there's some speculation necessary here uh, because we just don't know 100% why, but they seem to guess, um, and I, I think it would have been a reasonable guess, well, where do, where do synagogues meet? Well, along a river would be a place for it to meet, and so they go and they find some women there um, who are gathering. Verse 14, and there's a certain woman by name of Lydia, a seller of purple, 
uh, from the city of Thyatira. Thyatira is back in, in Turkey. Um, she's probably fairly wealthy. I'm guessing a widow, um, but she's got some money and she's got some skills. Um, and she's going to be the key to the founding of the church at uh, Philippi. Worshiping God, um, um, see, a certain woman was listening, whom the Lord opened her heart to attend to the things being spoken by Paul. So Lydia believes, verse 15, and as she was baptized and her household, uh, by the way, this plays into arguments over um, uh, whether uh, there was infant baptism in the early church. If she had young children, the baptism of her whole household would suggest that her servants and her children, and, and this is a group culture, the ancient world was a group world, and so it would be, in my mind, perfectly fitting with the culture for her to have everybody in her house um, get baptized. That makes sense to me, given the culture. But she begged them, saying, um, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, enter into my house and remain. And she persuaded us. So they're going to stay in the house of Lydia. Now, verse 16. Now, it came to pass... Um, as uh, we were going into the place of prayer, there was a certain girl having a Pythian spirit of Apollo, somebody who had a, she was possessed by um, something associated with the god Apollo. Now, I don't know if you're like me, I tend to view, um, I, I, well, when I was in high school, I viewed the gods like Apollo or Zeus as the fun little fictions. But you remember that in Paul's world, these are demonic forces. Um, not that there was one demon named Apollo, that's not what I'm saying at all, but that in every temple dedicated to Apollo, there were demons. I don't know what their names were, but, but that, uh, that I think the way Paul would have viewed it is that at all of these temples, there are demons. At every temple of Apollo, there is a demon, and that this woman is possessed of a Pythian demon, a demon associated with the god Apollo. She met us, Luke and Paul, and Timothy and Silas, who uh, she was bringing much wealth, much gain to her masters by uh, telling the future, by telling uh, spiritual things. Uh, verse 17, she, having followed Paul and us, was crying out saying, these men are servants of the Most High God. Um, and of course, they would have uh, the Greeks would have understood that to be Zeus, the king of the gods, but of course that's not what um, um, a Jew would think. Most high God is Yahweh, who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. Verse 18, and this she was doing for many days, and had Paul, having been distressed finally, and having turned in, in his spirit, he turned to the spirit, I'm sorry, and he said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out from her. And it came out from her that hour. And so she's now in her right mind. Verse 19. And her masters, having seen that the hope of their money had come out from her, they don't care about the girl, but their hope of money from the girl, having taken hold of Paul and Silas, they dragged them into the marketplace to the rulers. And usually the judgment place was in the marketplace, the bima. We'll see it at Corinth. Verse 20. And having uh, brought them up to the magistrates, they said, these men are troubling our city. They are Jews. And of course, some of the plays into the prejudices about Jews. And they are preaching customs, which it is not lawful for us to accept or to practice because we're Romans. We're better than they are. We would never believe in the kinds of, of gods that they have. Verse 22. And the crowd rose up against them. And the magistrates, having torn off their garments, they were commanding them to be beaten with rods. And so Paul and, and Silas and probably Luke um, and Timothy, whoever's with them, are taken out and beating, beaten. And, and having laid many blows upon them, they cast them into prison, having charged the jailer to keep them securely. We're going to meet this jailer again in a second, right? Uh, who, having received uh, such a command, he cast them into an inner uh, jail cell, an inner prison cell, and, and had their feet secured uh, in stocks. Okay, 
locked. So they're in the innermost part of the prison. Verse 25. And about the middle of the night, Paul and Silas were praying, and they were singing hymns to God. Um, now, we don't know exactly what hymns they were they were singing, but we, we know from Ephesians and such that the early church sang. They probably sang psalms, um, but they I believe the early church created some of their own hymns as well. We may find some of them, actually, in the New Testament. There's a there's a, a possible hymn in Philippians 2. There's a possible hymn in Colossians 1. Um, and so they had hymns in the early in the early church. There were prob- there, you might call some of the, the songs at the beginning of Luke, of uh, Mary, um, uh, Simon, uh, and so forth. You might call those hymns as well. Um, and the prisoners were listening to them. Verse 26, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and all of the chains were loosened, verse 27, and the jailer, having been awakened, um, and having seen the doors of the prison open, um, uh, he, having drawn, drawn his sword, he was about to kill himself, because, of course, the jailer is responsible. If, if, this is what, you know, the people who were watching Peter in Acts 12, those, deci- those uh, guards were put to death for not securing their prisoner. Uh, and the jailer here knows, man, I'm dying. I'm going to be dead. I'd rather do it myself than have to go through the, uh, the, the agony of what they'll do to me. Um, and so he's about to kill himself, supposing the prisoners to have escaped, verse 28. But Paul called out saying, um, uh, some manuscripts have with a great voice, but probably not. Uh, Paul called out with a, uh, saying, uh, do not do anything bad to yourself, for we are all here. Verse 29, and having asked for lights, he rushed in, and having, uh, having been terrified, so he's scared to death, he falls down, he fell down before Paul and Silas, verse 30, and having uh, brought them out, he said to them, sirs, what is it necessary for me, me to do to be saved? Now, what he means is, what can I do to keep you from running away? What can I do to keep you to stay here so that I'm saved and I don't die for this? Um, and there's a little bit, I always think of Groucho Marx here. Well, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Um, that's, that's a, Paul takes it in a different way than he means. He's, he's asking, what can I do to save my hide? And Paul's thinking about eternity, verse 31. And they said, believe, have faith upon the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. You and all your household. Um, again, there's this group idea. And this is the other place where his whole house is baptized, and probably this includes any children he might have. This is the way they would have thought in that culture, verse 32. And they spoke to him the word of the Lord, along with all those in his household, verse 33. And having taken them in that hour of the night, he washed, from, he washed their wounds, and he was baptized. He himself and all the ones with him immediately. Now, there are people who say, see, you must be baptized immediately. Um, there are people who would say, look, this is how the early church did it. And therefore, if you have a catechism, you know, that let's not have this weeks of instruction before you baptize people. This is descriptive. This is not prescriptive. Um, <clears throat> I think there is nothing wrong. Um, there's nothing prohibited to having a time of learning before a person is baptized. Um, of course, there's nothing wrong with baptizing a person immediately. The question is, I think, in my mind, is um, uh, the question of whether a person knows exactly uh, what they are confessing, that a person knows what they are believing in, that a person knows. I think, I think uh, again, uh, in terms of the discipleship process, um, a person will be on a more stable and long-standing journey if there is a little bit of, um, of training that goes before baptism. But of course, that's the tradition I come from. The Wesleyan tradition doesn't baptize immediately. Um, now, there are Wesleyans that do it because we've been baptistified um, in, in many quarters. So I'm not saying that's wrong. There are churches who they're going to baptize you the next Sunday. Um, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I'm just, I would uh, disagree with those who would say we have to do that because that's the way, because baptism doesn't save you, right? We're not saved by baptism. Baptism is a outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. 
Um, anyway, verse 34, and having brought them into the house, um, he set a table for them and he rejoiced with all his household, having had his put his faith upon God. And the, the perfect tense here suggests that, and it's still, he still had faith. He not only did it, but it, it stayed with him. Verse 35. Now, when it became day, the magistrates uh, sent officers saying, release the Kraken. No, release those men. Verse 36. And the jailer uh, announced these words to Paul. Quote, uh, the captains have sent in order for you to be released. Now, Therefore, go uh, in peace. Now, <laughs> oh, Paul. <laughs> Paul, verse 37, and Paul said to them, okay, having beaten us publicly, uncondemned men, and here's the point, being Roman citizens. Silas is a Roman citizen. Paul is a Roman citizen. They cast us into prison, Roman citizens, and now secretly, they want to send us out? Okay, they're in deep trouble. You simply cannot beat a Roman citizen without charges being brought against them. They are in deep dookie here. And Paul says, no way. You have them, they themselves, have them come down here and bring us out. Now, verse 38, when they told the soldier, when the when the officers told the soldier these words, they were shaken in their boots. They were afraid, having heard that they were Roman citizens. By the way, I think I think Paul had always been embarrassed that he was a Roman. I think Paul, Paul thought this could be because, of course, uh, later on in Acts, it will say that he was a Roman citizen from birth. Um, if it if it didn't say that he was a Roman citizen, from birth, I would suspect that Sergius Paulus is the one who had given him his Roman citizen. But let's let's go with what Acts says and say he was a Roman citizen uh, from birth. I think Paul must have always been embarrassed of it because it, it went against the idea that he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. How could a Hebrew of the Hebrews be a Roman citizen? And so I think Paul was embarrassed and ashamed that he was a Roman citizen. But some, first of all, he has to be thinking, you know, why would I be beaten? I don't have to be beaten. I'm a Roman citizen. I don't want to be beaten anymore. And so you can see Paul saying, I think next time I'm going to tell them before they beat me that I'm a Roman citizen. And that's what we see him do from now on. But I think a light goes on. When Paul, when Paul was on the island of Cyprus preaching to Sergius Paulus, I think Paul realized, you know what? And, and especially here, let me say especially here, I can use my Roman citizenship for the good of the gospel. Sometimes there are things in our past that we're embarrassed about that God can sanctify and use in a, a magnificent way. And it seems like this is one of those moments where Paul realizes that. Verse 39, and having come, uh, they appealed to them, having brought them out, they were asking them, please leave our city, please, pretty please. Verse 40, and having gone out from the jail, uh, they came to Lydia, and having seen them, they exhorted the brothers, and then they departed. And so Paul ends up leaving, uh, and Silas, and Timothy, uh, the city of Philippi. But Luke, as we will see next week, uh, stays in Philippi. So this has been through the Bible in 10 years, Acts chapter 16. Lord willing, we'll see you next week with Acts 17.